Biological Science. I'm Angela and I'm one of the application scientists here at Edinburgh Instrument and I'll be the host of today's talk. This webinar is the third in our latest series of Raman focused presentations to coincide with the recent launch of the new RMS 1000 Raman microscope. If you've missed any of our previous webinars, which focused on the theory of Raman spectroscopy and also Raman spectroscopy's use with polymer samples, you can find them on our website. This talk will last approximately 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. Please ask any questions that you have in the chat box on the right hand side. Feel free to ask anything as it comes to your mind throughout the session. You don't need to wait until the end as I'll be reading the questions as they come in and preparing them for our speaker. And with that, let's introduce today's presenter. Dr. Stuart Thompson joined Edinburgh Instruments in 2017 as an application scientist. He studied physics and chemistry at the University of St. Andrews and continued at St. Andrews to complete his doctorate in semiconductor optoelectronics. His studies focused on loss mechanisms in perovskites and organic solar cells and light emitting diodes using Raman, photoluminescence and electrical spectroscopy. And with that, I'll hand over to Stuart to deliver today's talk. Over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Angela. So as Angela saying, my talk today is going to be on how you can apply Raman and PL microscopy to materials characterization. So I'll start with a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to start off with an intro to confocal Raman and PL microscopy, uh, just a brief overview of how the microscope works and how it relates to the rest of the talk, for those of you not familiar with the instrument. I'm then going to move on to how Raman and PL can be used to image 2D materials. Then move on to more three-dimensional materials, bulk materials where we need to do depth profiling through a certain thickness and how Raman can be used to identify components spread throughout multiple layers. And going to finish off with some photoluminescence mapping uh, of solar cells, since that's a hot topic in material science at the moment. Before I get started on that, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to who Edinburgh Instruments are, for those of you not familiar with us. We're based near Edinburgh, Scotland and we've been manufacturing scientific instrumentation for over 40 years. The company was founded in 1971 as a spin-out from Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh. And then our first fluorescent spectrometer was released seven years later, and then this has been expanded to transient absorption spectroscopy and to now Raman microscopy. At Edinburgh Instruments, we design and manufacture instrumentation for molecular spectroscopy, and this covers the full range of steady state and time resolved optical spectroscopy techniques. And the one I'm going to be focusing on today is the Raman and PL microscopy. So that leads me to the first section of uh, today's talk is what is confocal microscopy? Uh, here is a kind of simplified layout of how a confocal microscope works uh, for both photoluminescence and Raman. So I'll go through the, the basic components. So if we start off with the excitation source, which is nearly always a laser. So the laser comes in, it's then uh, reflected off a dichroic mirror and down towards the objective lens. Uh, this focuses the, the beam onto the sample. Uh, to a point that then excites the sample at that point and the sample is placed on a microscope stage and this stage is nearly always motorized so which allows you to move the point that where the laser hits on the surface of the sample so these microscope stages can be moved in the x y and z direction where z is the up in the vertical uh, axis this excitation either creates photoluminescence or Raman, depending on what you want to look at, 
which is then reflected from the sample and collected by the objective lens. So it's a reflection configuration, also known as an epi configuration. And this photoluminescence or Raman then passes up through the dichroic mirror and is then filtered through a rejection filter. So this removes all the uh, excitation wavelength that might have got to this point. So the laser wavelength is blocked here. And then the photoluminescence and Raman uh, signal is focused down through a pinhole. So this is the defining feature of a confocal microscope. And it's something I'll be exploring in more detail uh, later in the talk. But for now, just note it's there. Uh, the signal then continues, focused into the entrance slit of the spectrograph. So the spectrograph is used to wavelength select uh, the signal. So the light comes in, it's focused using a mirror onto a grating, a diffraction grating, and this separates the, the, wave, uh, the light into its constituents' wavelengths. This is usually a grating turret. Uh, so in the, I've shown three here, but on our uh, Raman microscopes, there's actually five grating turrets. And if you want to do photoluminescence, for example, you would look, use a diffraction grating with a low dispersion uh, because you typically have very broad spectra. If you want to do Raman microscopy, you would have a, a high groove density grating uh, to get for the higher resolution that's required uh, to analyze the Raman peaks. So this turret allows you to change the modality of the instrument depending on the resolution and spectral range that you require. The light that's now been separated at its constituents' wavelengths then passes on as in an image using a mirror onto a CCD camera. So the CCD camera allows you to acquire the full spectrum in a single shot. And for both photoluminescence and Raman, for steady state measurements, you would use the CCD camera. I've also drawn here a second detector and I'll be explaining this in more depth for the talk, but the RMS-1000 can also function as a photoluminescence lifetime uh, microscope. So there's now a, a single point detector, a photomultiply tube to measure photoluminescence lifetimes. So instead of imaging onto the CCD, the light can be directed through a slit and onto the PMT for lifetime measurements. I hope that gives you a brief uh, overview of how these instruments work because I'll be referring to this, the various parts of this throughout the rest of the talk. And what these look like in practice, this is our RM5 Raman microscope and this is the RMS1000, its big brother. So both of these are confocal Raman microscopes and the main difference is that the RMS-1000 is a more modular instrument. You can couple external lasers into it. And it's also larger because you can add a, a longer focal length spectrograph for higher resolution. And for this talk, what's also important is that it's designed to be a Raman and photoluminescence microscope. The RM5 can do some photoluminescence, but for photoluminescence lifetime and true photoluminescence spectra, it's the RMS-1000. And all the measurements that I'm going to show throughout this uh, webinar are based around the RMS-1000. That brings me on to the first application section of today's talk, which is looking at 2D materials. The most famous 2D material is by far graphene. And I'm sure everybody in this webinar is familiar with the material. Uh, graphene has excellent electronic, thermal, and structural properties, which make it a very promising material to incorporate into semiconductor and electronic devices. And Raman uh, microscopy has established itself as one of the optimum ways in order to investigate the electronic properties of graphene. And it's those electronic properties that are useful for its end user applications. And they can be fine-tuned and adjusted and investigated using Raman. And in fact, it's something like 30% of confocal Raman microscope papers uh, published last year were published uh, on graphene. It's by far the biggest application. So why is Raman so good at analyzing graphene? 
So the, the key point is that the bands observed in the Raman spectrum, which correspond to the phonon modes, are directly related to the electronic structure of the graphene. So if we consider a pristine monolayer of graphene, so a hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms, it has two defining Raman bands. We've got the G band at 1580 wave numbers and the 2D band at 2680. However, creating graphene that is perfect, as shown here, is very difficult. And generally, there's always going to be some amount of defects in the structure. And controlling these defects is very important for electronic applications, as they're going to change the electronic properties of the graphene. So examples of defects are dislocations in the lattice, or simply where the lattice ends uh, also counts as a defect. And when these defects are present in the graphene lattice, an additional Raman band becomes active, the D band, at 1350 wave numbers. So Raman uh, microscopy can be used to image the location and the density of defects within your sample. An example of this is shown here. So on the left here is a white light image of the graphene surface. So this is a reflected bright field image where the graphene surface has been imaged using a white light illumination source, so traditional microscopy. And then that image captures in a camera. And you can see that on the white light image, the graphene is very featureless. It's almost impossible to characterize graphene uh, using traditional optical microscopy. However, if we then compare the same sample, but now we're doing a Raman image, you can see you contain much more information. So what this image on the right is, is that the microscope is scanned across the surface uh, of this graphene layer, and the intensity of the 1350 peak is integrated. So the, that corresponds to the defects. So on this color plot here, where we have a dark background, that means there's very low defect density. We have kind of perfect pristine graphene. And where the bright regions are has a high 1350 peak, indicating that defects are present here. So this demonstrates how confocal Raman microscopy can be used to image the location of the defects. And from this information, you can determine, is this defect density suitable for your application? Or do you need to refine your synthesis procedure in order to optimize this defect distribution? Another example of where uh, Raman microscopy can be used in graphene is determining the number of layers. So in the strictest sense, graphene only refers to a single monolayer. However, it's quite difficult to make monolayer graphene. And typically, you can end up with multi-layer graphene. And generally, up to about five layers is still considered graphene. And But this is important because the electronic properties change depending on if you've got monolayer or multi-layer graphene. And run microscopy can be used to distinguish between these two regimes. So with monolayer graphene, you've typically got the scenario where the G band compared to the D band, uh, 2D band uh, is at least a ratio of two. So if the 2D band is twice as high as the G band, this is a good indication that you've got monolayer graphene present. If this ratio, if when you move to multi-layer graphene, the G band intensity increases because you now have more layers in the graphene and the 2D band decreases because and broadens out as it splits into multiple peaks. So this ratio then becomes lower than two and typically the G band becomes much higher than the 2D. So using this information, you can determine whether you've got monolayer or multilayer graphene and whether that's needs to be adjusted in your synthesis procedure depending on which type of graphene you want. And like the previous example, you could also map across the surface of the graphene and monitor which regions are monolayer and which are multilayer. Moving away from graphene onto a, another 2D material. So this one is transition metal dichalcogenide monolayers or TMD monolayers for short. 
And these are a very hot topic at the moment as they're considered kind of next generation graphene. So a structure of these is shown on the right. So the idea is you've got a transition metal, typically the molybdenum or tungsten, uh, with a chalcogen such as sulfur, selenium or tellurium. And they give this MX2 uh, structure. So it's basically like an inorganic analog of graphene. And the reason that these are such a hot topic is that despite graphene's excellent uh, electronic properties, one of its main downsides is that it has no band gap. And for semiconductor applications, you require a band gap, such as to make a transistor. So graphene in its pure form acts as a metal. And there have been some investigations uh, and work put into trying to create a band gap in graphene. For example, you can oxidize it to make graphene oxide, but generally the band gaps are very small and you've got limited control. And the, the kind of hot topic about transition metal dicogenides is that in a monolayer, these are direct band gap semiconductors and therefore can be integrated into semiconductor electronics. And like graphene, they can be imaged using confocal ramen and also for these now confocal photoluminescence microscopy. And shown here is a, a ramen image of isolated uh, molybdenum sulfide monolayer triangles, which are now explained in more detail. So what does the ramen of molybdenum sulfide look like? So the Raman spectrum is shown here on the right, and molybdenum sulfide has a fairly simple Raman spectrum, at least in the fingerprint region. It consists of two main bands, one about 382 uh, wave numbers and 405 wave numbers. And these correspond to two different phonon modes uh, in the hexagonal uh, molybdenum sulfide lattice. And if we integrate the intensity of these phonon modes and scan across the surface of the sample, you can then generate this uh, Raman intensity profile, which images the molybdenum sulfide uh, nanoflake. And you can see it has this triangular structure that uh, many of the transition metal dicogenides uh, tend to adopt. Looking at this more closely, we can see that the intensity in the surrounding region is mostly constant, but at the center, there's this bright spot. And if you look at the scale here, this corresponds to stronger RAM and scattering intensity in the center. And this is a good indication that we may have monolayer uh, molybdenum sulfide on the outside and multilayer molybdenum sulfide, which scatters more strongly in the center. And you can see I've marked these points one and two, and that corresponds to one and two uh, on the spectrum on the right. And if we look at the, the separation between the peaks, the fingerprint region here uh, and the ramen can be used to distinguish between monolayer and multilayer molybdenum sulfide. So monolayer typically has a narrower separation between the two peaks. And as we move uh, to region two, you can see that separation increases from 17 to 21 wave numbers. So the combination of the higher scattering intensity at the center and also this separation of the peaks suggests that there's a multi-layer defect in the middle of this molybdenum sulfide nanoflake. If this is true, we should also be able to see the same thing by using photoluminescence microscopy. So here is the same image, uh, the same molybdenum sulfide nanoflake, but now it's been imaged uh, using photoluminescence. So the, the experimental configuration is very similar. It's the same sample, the same laser, the same power, but the main difference is that the diffraction grating inside the RMS 1000 has now been changed from a high groove density grating. So 1800 grooves per millimeter down to 300 grooves per millimeter. And this allows you to cover a much broader range uh, to capture the photoluminescence. So looking at this, these spikes on the left are the ramen that we were looking at in the last slide. So molybdenum sulfide, 
peaks are about here and there's also some spikes uh, due to this being on a silicon substrate which has its own Raman spectrum and then this broad feature is the photoluminescence of the molybdenum sulfide and this image on the the left here is the integrated intensity of this photoluminescent spectrum. So you can see it shows the same general shape, but the interesting part is that it shows the opposite intensity profile to the Raman. The Raman had a bright point in the center, whereas the photoluminescence is bright around the sides and has a, an intensity dip in the center. And this is confirms what we suspected from the Raman data that there's multi-layer molybdenum sulfide present as the photoluminescence quantum yield of molybdenum sulfide is typically much higher in the monolayer state than in multi-layer because as you move from monolayer molybdenum sulfide to multi-layer you change from a direct band gap semiconductor to an indirect band gap and when you move to indirect band gaps your photoluminescence quantum yield decreases and you can see this intensity dip as a result so this is a good example of how Raman and photoluminescence can both be applied to the same material to give complementary information. And with the combination of the two measurements, you can confirm what is happening at a structural level. You can also extend this to a much wider area. So this is still molybdenum sulfide, but we're now looking at a continuous film of molybdenum sulfide deposited using chemical vapor deposition. And this is a Raman intensity map. And you can see that the Raman can be used to analyze the quality of your molybdenum sulfide or transition metal dichogenide film. So you can see there's bright spots here, which suggest that there may be multi-layer molybdenum sulfide present. And you can also clearly see the grain boundaries uh, and so you get an indication of how good uh, your molybdenum sulfide film is and whether you need to improve your deposition procedure to get a higher quality film or not. And as I was saying, 2D materials in general are a very important application area of Raman. Uh, that's all I'm going to talk about them today, but next year we'll be doing a webinar solely dedicated to analyzing these 2D materials using photoluminescence and Raman in more detail. I now move on to a different application area, which is now moving away from nanomaterials to looking at bulk materials and how Raman can be used to investigate the change in material properties through a function of depth through the sample. So for many applications in material science, you have multiple layers. So some examples are protective coatings in industry, typically composed of several layers. Or you might want to look at how the properties of a single material change as a function of depth. For example, looking at degradation and permutation through a substrate. Many polymers that are deposited are deposited as laminates. So one polymer deposited top of the other to get a combination of their properties. And also in semiconductor manufacturing, you very always have a stack of different materials, one atop the other. So we would like to use Raman microscopy to image how these properties change as a function of depth or identify different properties at different locations through the sample. And this is something we can do using confocal Raman but we have some challenges to overcome to do it. So the main challenge to get any information along this depth or Z axis, as it's more commonly called, is that when you excite the sample, so if you put the objective lens is up here, the laser's coming in and you get this three dimensional excitation volume. So your laser, is effectively sighting at every point along the z-axis. And as a result of this, if you were simply to try and measure the Raman spectrum as a function of z, you would have a very blurred image as you would have out-of-focus contributions 
from every possible Z value here because the laser is exciting the entire volume. To show this uh, on a different picture, so this is the same principle, but now looking at a, a 2D projection onto the sample. So the green here shows this, this excitation volume that I was talking about, where this is our z-axis. And if you've got Raman scatter originating above the focal plane, so the focal plane is marked here with the dashed white line. If you've got Raman scattering originate from above, this is collected by the objective and is focused and reaches the detector. The Raman scatter from below the focal plane also reaches the detector and the focal plane. So you collect from the entire excitation volume and you can, can get no depth information. And the solution to this is to introduce the confocal pinhole that I showed on one of the first slides. And the idea of the confocal pinhole is to give you this depth uh, resolution. So if we have Raman scatter originating from above the focal plane, this is now blocked by the pinhole from progressing further. The same when it originates from below, and it's only Raman scatter that originates at the focal plane or very close to it that is focused through the pinhole and can reach the detector. So the pinhole blocks the out of focus Raman scatter from reaching the detector and improves the axial resolution. And I should mention here also that the there's you sometimes see if you're looking at Raman microscopes the terms truly confocal and pseudo confocal and the RMS-1000 and the RM5 are both truly confocal microscopes. And what this means is there's a physical pinhole in the confocal plane of the microscope. And this gives you optimum uh, spatial resolution. Some microscopes are known as pseudo-confocal, which simulate this pinhole uh, using a combination of their spectrograph entrance slit and their CCD uh, detection region. But this does not result in the optimum spatial resolution that you can achieve by using a true pinhole. Another important parameter of the pinhole is its size. It's not good enough just to have a single pinhole, as if the pinhole is too wide, the out-of-focus scatter can still enter the spectrograph and be detected. And you might then ask, then why do we not always just use a very narrow pinhole? And the reason is that this reduces the throughput of the Raman uh, scatter through your instrument and would lower the intensity. So if you've got a wide pinhole, you have much higher throughput, higher intensity. So you can acquire in a shorter amount of time. If you've got a narrow pinhole, you've got better axial resolution, but you reduce the throughput. And you really want a way to balance these two depending on your application. And the RM5 and the RMS1000 both have adjustable pinholes that can be changed from 25 microns to 2 millimeters, depending on how much confocality is required for your application. So you can change from a high confocality, low throughput mode to a non-confocal, high throughput mode. And for those of you listening who might have no interest in looking at a uh, depth profiling or samples with multiple layers, the confocal band hole also has other benefits beyond just the axial resolution. So it also includes the lateral resolution of the microscope, so the XY resolution, and more importantly, it improves the image contrast. So in Raman and photoluminescence microscopy, you typically have a lot of background light. Uh, so in Raman background fluorescence and in photoluminescence and background scattering and by narrowing the pinhole width you remove this background and improve the contrast uh, of your Raman and photoluminescence images. An example of how the confocal pinhole can be used in practice is looking at multi-layer polymers. So here we have a PET, PVC, PET polymer stack, where PET and PVC are two types of commonly used polymer. And here they've been incorporated into a laminated structure. 
uh, with multiple layers. And we can use Raman microscopy to profile through these layers. And if we didn't know the plastics, we could identify which plastic was in each layer. An example of these Raman depth profiles are shown here. So I'll just take a couple of minutes here to explain what's shown here. So the x-axis here is still the Raman shift as you show in any Raman spectrum. But instead of showing the Raman spectrum as an intensity profile with lines, the, the spectral positions are instead shown by color. So where we have bright color here means you've got a strong Raman peak. And the y-axis of this plot is now the z-depth for the sample. So this is a function of depth in micrometers uh, through this uh, PET PVC polymer stack. And you can see that the Raman spectrum changes when you have PET, you've got peaks here, and the PVC has additional Raman peaks around the 600 to 800 region. And so you can see that there's multiple layers in this material, and you could import these into an analytics program if you didn't know what the material were to identify the composition of this layer, the different layers. And you can also see here that there's two different images. So one of these was measured with a 100 micron pinhole and the other with a 25. So if we look at the 100 first, you can see that the, the Raman peaks are blurring between the different layers. So the PET peaks around 1400 are blurring into the PVC. But if we move to a 25 micron pinhole, so which has superior axial resolution, you can see there's much clearer discrimination between the layers. And this is an example of how you can adjust the pinhole width in order to get the desired axial resolution for your measurement. I'll now move on to the final part of today's talk, which is on photoluminescence mapping of perovskite solar cells. So I'm sure mo uh, most of you are already familiar with perovskites, but since we have quite a broad audience here from both a, a Raman background and a photoluminescence background, I'll give a brief introduction for those not familiar. So they're named after the Russian mineralogist Count Lev Atlasevich von Perovsky. And in the broadest sense, they refer to any compound that obeys the ABX3 crystal structure shown here on the right. However, the great interest and boom in papers published on these materials are on so-called hybrid perovskites. And these are the perovskite structures that contain both an organic and an inorganic component. So the, the kind of classic example is methyl ammonium lead iodide. So it has an organic cation in the center, the methyl ammonium, surrounded with inorganic uh, octahedra of iodine lead. And these have received widespread attention due to their excellent solar cell performance and are now also been investigated for other applications such as laser gain materials and light emitting diodes. But our focus on their solar cell application here today, since that's by far their, their widest use. So photoluminescence is a great method to investigate uh, the performance of solar cells and per perovskite solar cells in particular. So the idea here is that when you excite the perovskite layer, you promote an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, and you can then monitor the photoluminescence decay back to the valence band. So you can either monitor the intensity and or the wavelength of this transition or the lifetime. So the length of time it takes for the electron to fall back to the valence band. And this is very useful because this is effectively the same process that's occurring inside the solar cell. So perovskites which have good photoluminescence properties also make good solar cells. And these the uh, perovskite solar cells are typically composed of multiple layers. It's not just perovskite. There's a electron and hole extraction layers, and this is to aid electrons and holes from moving out of the perovskite into the uh, uh, the different the anode and cathode. And it's 
the function of the electron hole extraction layers that I'm going to focus on in this last part of the talk. So the perovskite stack that we're going to look at under the RMS-1000 microscope is shown here on the left. So we have ITO glass and deposited on the ITO glass is islands of carbon nanotubes. So they're patterned onto the ITO glass substrate and each of these blue squares is actually composed of even smaller squares uh, of these carbon nanotube islands. We've then got the perov and this uh, carbon nanotube is to act as the hole extraction layer. So electrons and holes are generated in the perovskite and we want to get those holes into the ITO glass as efficiently as possible. And to do that, we're going to use the carbon nanotubes. And then the rest of the stack is to do to deal with the electrons. So I'll show it here. Uh, so we've got PC61BM as an electron extraction layer, then BCP is a blocking layer, and then a silver electrode. But for this study, we're going to focus on the perovskite and the carbon nanotube ITO glass for the holes. Just to show what this looks like in practice, uh, this is an SEM image from this paper, which we were a collaborator on. And so the carbon nanotubes are vertically aligned on the surface. So you get this forest of carbon nanotubes that are standing vertically on top of the ITO and then the perovskite layer is deposited on top uh, of these carbon nanotubes. And we want to investigate how well these nanotubes extract holes from the perovskite. So on the left here is a reflected dark field image of this perovskite uh, carbon nanotube layer. So you can see the squares present and these are the uh, carbon nanotube islands that I was describing in the last slide. And this grainy structure over the top of everything is the perovskite uh, layer that's been deposited on top. So this is image using white light using the camera inside the RMS-1000. If we now excite the perovskite layer with a laser and look at the photoluminescence, we can get a photoluminescence intensity map of the surface of the sample. So you can see here that the bright regions correspond to high photoluminescence and the dark regions low. And you can see that the photoluminescence is low when it's deposited on top of the carbon nanotubes. And an important point to work out, to, uh, to highlight, is that each point in this plot is an individual spectrum and we can extract each of these individual spectra to look at how the spectral uh, shape changes as well. So I've highlighted point one here and point two and then pulled the spectra out of this map and they're shown here. So you can see on the spectral profile as well that you've got higher intensity where there's no carbon nanotubes present and then the photoluminescence decreases. So this is a good indication that the carbon nanotubes are extracting holes from the perovskite because to get photoluminescence, you require both an electron and a hole, which then recombine to give the photoluminescence. If the holes are extracted by the carbon nanotubes, they can no longer recombine. And so you should observe this drop in PL intensity that we do here. One open question though is that, is this drop in PL intensity due to hole extraction or is it due to there simply being less perovskite present on top of these carbon nanotubes? You could make the argument that the perovskite might deposit differently depending whether you're depositing on top of ITO or depositing on top of the carbon nanotubes. And so it might simply be there's less perovskite and therefore less emission intensity on top of these carbon nanotube layers. And so we would really like a way to independently verify that whole extraction is occurring. And the solution to this is to use photoluminescence lifetime mapping. So to monitor the photoluminescence lifetime now instead of the intensity and see if we see the same behavior. To do this, 
The RMS-1000 can be equipped with time-correlated single photon counting electronics. Uh, for those of you who do photoluminescence spectroscopy, you're probably already familiar, but I'll give a brief introduction for the people coming from a Raman background. So the idea of TCSPC is that you have a laser, a pulse diode laser source. So this is a type of a high repetition rate laser. And you excite your sample with the laser. And when the laser fires, it also fires a trigger pulse to the electronics. So the laser fires, you send a trigger pulse, it reaches your TCSPC electronics and starts the clock. Your sample is excited by the laser. It emits a photon. This photon is detected using the PMT. So this is, I showed this on one of the first slides. You could have this secondary detector. So this can be mounted on the RMS-1000. So you can have a CCD camera uh, and a PMT mounted on each spectrograph. And since there's two spectrographs available, that's four detectors in total. Uh, you can mount to the RMS-1000. When this receives a photon, it creates a, an electrical pulse out of that photon and this stops the TC, uh, TCSPC electronics. And so the idea of this measurement is you measure the time difference between the start and the stop. And you then plot these time differences on a histogram. So the first photon comes in and we get a single point on our histogram. Another photon comes in, you get another point and you repeat this process until the entire photoluminescence decay is acquired. And the RMS-1000 can be equipped with uh, Edinburgh Instruments series of pulse diode lasers, so they're the EPL. So these are picosecond pulse diode laser sources and they mount in the back of the RMS-1000 and you can swap between different laser wavelengths to do time-resolved photoluminescence microscopy. To show this in practice, so this is the same uh, perovskite carbon nanotube sample as I showed before, but we're now focusing into a smaller region. So there's just four carbon nanotube squares. And if we excite this now with our pulse diode laser and measure the photoluminescence lifetime, we get this intensity profile. So here, the color plot is no longer an intensity, it's now a lifetime. So the dark regions have a low average lifetime and the bright regions have a high average lifetime. And you can see that there's dark regions where the carbon nanotubes are present and uh, bright regions where they're not. And if we look at points one and two, we can extract the time profiles out of this map. And we can see that point one has a longer photoluminescence decay and therefore a longer average lifetime than point two. And this is what we'd expect if we have hole extraction, because if holes are pulled out of the perovskite film, they can no longer recombine and they should shorten the photoluminescence lifetime the faster they're extracted out of the perovskite. And this is what we see here. So here the, the lifetime data is gave independent confirmation of what we observed in the intensity profile that the carbon nanotubes are indeed extracting holes out of the perovskite. And so you get the complementary information from both techniques. And that brings me to the end of today's webinar. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please input them into the chat function and Angela will relay them to me. Thank you very much.